Are we starting? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I wanted to take a few minutes to discuss some of the Adobe uh, Connect um, platform information. Um, so first of all, I wanted to point out that we do have several documents available for download. If you uh, see that in the top right-hand corner of the screen, uh, to download the documents, you will select the document and then click on Download File. Next, I also wanted to point out our chat feature, which it looks like many of you have already discovered, uh, to type in a message. Um, you can go ahead and type that in and then hit the enter button. For those of you joining today's webinar in a group, please go ahead and enter the number of people that have joined you into the chat box. If you're joining alone, you do not need to enter anything at this time. At the end of today's webinar, we'll have a Q&A session. And we encourage you to answer your questions during the meeting in the chat pod. We will also post this webinar on today uh, today's webinar online on our online university. You can access the online university at www.nttac.org, and this information will be available in approximately three weeks. Again, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And now I'll turn it over to Ann Nelson, who is our moderator for today's webinar. Hello and welcome. We're pleased you've joined us today for the webinar, The Challenges of Working with Girls in the Juvenile Justice System. This webinar is hosted by the National Partnership for Juvenile Services and the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention National Training and Technical Assistance Center. My name is Ann Nelson, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors for the National Partnership for Juvenile Services. The partnership is a nonprofit organization dedicated to serving all professionals across the juvenile services continuum and ensuring positive outcomes for at-risk and delinquent youth and their families. We're very pleased to have you with us for what we will, will be an excellent and informative pre presentation. Before um, we begin, I want to just address a couple of housekeeping matters. First, this webinar is meant to be interactive, and we do encourage everyone to submit questions through the chat function on your screen. Following the panelist presentations, we'll have a question and answer period during which time we will address as many of your questions as possible. You may submit questions at any time during the broadcast. Second, at the conclusion of the webinar, we would appreciate it if you would complete a survey on the presentation. The survey will pop up automatically when you exit the program. Having your feedback on this survey is vitally important to us as we plan for future revenue, re, re, webinars and training. Um, OK, our first, let me just do a little intro. Um, girls in the juvenile justice system are first and foremost teenage girls. We need to see them as girls in the midst of attempting to understand themselves and determining who they are, girls who have existing strengths, assets, and wisdom, girls with major life stressors and trauma histories, girls with survival and coping skills, some of which are unsafe and unhealthy and illegal, and some of which are healthy, safe, and creative. The webinar will examine the challenges of and strategies for serving females during their time in the system. Today's objectives will enable participants to be able to discuss strategies to support programming and care for LGBTQ females in confinement settings, examine the need for female responsive trauma-informed care, and understand the challenges of health and trauma screening assessment for females in confinement settings. We're going to open the webinar by giving everyone the opportunity to hear from Paula Schaefer. Paula is a consultant for the Child Welfare and Juvenile Justice System, providing technical assistance to state, county, and private agencies on implementing a female and culturally responsive, trauma-informed, and restorative continuum of services for girls. In addition to her consulting work, Paula has extensive experience as a practitioner working in programs that serve girls. It's my pleasure to welcome Paula Schaefer. Hello, everybody. I am so happy to be here with all of you, and I can't tell you how Wonderful, I think it is that a thousand people registered 
for a webinar on girls. That's fantastic. Um, I want to say I'm delighted to be here to do this webinar with Leslie Akoka and Lori Schaffner. I think the partnership put together a really good program for all of us today. So um, I'm, again, very happy to be here. I want to give a great shout out um, to all of the people. I, I've seen the registration list, and I see very, very many names all over the country of uh, people who have been advocating for girls for many, many years. So I want to send a shout out to all of you who have been doing this work for a long, long time, in the good times and the bad. Um, I think we're heading back into some good times, so we'll talk a little bit about that. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to advance my own slides, so I'm not sure who did that. Um, <laughs> but girls are not the challenge. Even though the title of this is that uh, challenges of working with girls, we all know that it's really about us. It's about the systems that are supposed to be advocating and helping girls. We know that girls are touched by numerous systems, social service systems, public health, human services, criminal and juvenile justice, housing, education, treatment services. And really, the, the issue is the degree to which girls' gender and cultural needs are recognized, acknowledged, and met in all of these systems can either interrupt or perpetuate the intergenerational cycle of crime, poverty, chemical dependency, and abuse. And I think it's safe to say that we aren't doing as much as we can about interrupting that intergenerational cycle of abuse. So again, that's why I'm glad that we're all here today. Our biggest challenge is that we don't have a unified approach to juvenile justice in the United States for girls or for boys. The closest we come to a unified approach is the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, the JJDPA Act. Many of you are familiar with that. Some of you aren't, and I encourage you to find out more about this. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. So the, um, the last time the act was reauthorized was in 2002. Um, it's based on a broad consensus that youth and families involved in the system should be guarded by federal standards for care and custody while also upholding the interest of community safety and the prevention of victimization. So there's so much more that we could talk about with the JJDP Act, but I'm not going to do that here. But what I, what I will do is just share with you some of the important updates provisions in the bill that it's already gone through the House, and it's going to be up for full Senate vote in the coming um, session. So here are some of the updates and provisions. It would phase out an exception that allows children who commit status offenses to be detained. We're still detaining youth who are, um, again, can I just ask that I'll, I'll uh, advance my slides. It, they keep advancing and I'm not, <laughs> anyhow. OK, so uh, we keep detaining kids' status offenses, girl, particularly girls, um, and we need to stop that. So another update or provision would require that juveniles be separated from adults in the criminal justice system during the pre-trial period. It would also require states to set measurable ways to reduce racial and ethnic disparities in the juvenile justice system and publicly report the results. It also provides um, to, or has a provision to make federal funding for evidence-based programs a higher priority and add grant accountability reforms. So um, what I want to say is that, please, this is really important that the bill gets reauthorized. So please call your legislators to support this bill. It does matter. Um, Francine Sherman wrote an article on behalf of National Crittenden Foundation, which I'll give you the resource for that down the line, um, related to gender injustice, why the JJDP Act matters for systems involved girls. And she talks about statistics, the increase of girls in the system over the last few years. So please support the bill. Call your legislatures, legislators. OK, so um, we were talking earlier before uh, we all got, or you all got on the webinar, about how we used to have a really solid movement um, about girls in the child welfare and juvenile justice system many, many years ago. And then it sort of went away, not sort of went away. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I have hope for girls 
in the child welfare and juvenile justice system because of three emerging and re-emerging movements. The first one is trauma-informed care movement. We have so much fantastic research now about how the brain works, neurobiological impact of childhood maltreatment, et cetera. And we have a lot of research that specifically addresses youth in the juvenile justice system and specifically girls in the juvenile justice system related to their trauma exposure, particularly their sexual abuse, sexual violence exposure. We're going to talk about that. Um, number two, the new girls movement, the new national girls movement, which I really do see is rising from the ashes. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how, uh, what's happening with that. It really has to do with awesome new research that's been coming out fast and furious in the last couple of years and also because of national organizations like National Crittenden Foundation, um, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Girls Institute, which is by the National Girls uh, or National Crittenden Foundation. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And number three, the federal and state safe harbors legislation for sexually exploited youth. I see all three of these as having a great impact, a good positive impact on girls in the juvenile justice system. So let's talk a little bit more about the trauma-informed care movement. It really is a call to action. We, I've said through, over the years that there is a direct link between girls' trauma exposure, particularly sexual abuse, and delinquency. But now, we, because of all the research and because there's been such a push for trauma-informed care, um, we now know we have to do something about it. Wherever we sit on a continuum of services for girls, that's administrators, policymakers, funders, direct service providers, we all need to incorporate understanding of trauma, trauma exposure, and trauma-informed care in our services. Um, and this is why, again, because of the fabulous research and uh, neurobiological impact research, we know that people don't just get over trauma. We know that our girls, many of whom that enter the system, have polyvictimization histories starting at very young ages, and that without adequate help and support, that it's just going to, it, it, trauma ends up getting people stuck, if you will. And I know Leslie will talk a little bit more about the health impact of trauma um, in her presentation. But really, we want to help girls get unstuck. Whether they talk about the, what actually has happened to them or not, we need to provide them with information. Number one, that they're not crazy because they think a certain way, they feel a certain way, they behave a certain way, all in relation to their trauma exposure. We want to help them know that they're not alone, it's not their fault, and how they can access resources that are really going to help them move forward and um, that they'll be in control of their trauma rather than trauma being in control of them. So trauma-informed care, um, substance abuse, mental health services, services um, health administration, SAMHSA, this is a definition from them, a strength-based service delivery approach grounded in an understanding of and responsiveness to the impact of trauma. We're talking about physical, emotional, and psychological safety in trauma-informed care. Uh, trauma-informed care creates opportunities for survivors to build or rebuild a sense of control and empowerment. And under, organizations that are trauma-informed understand and are vigilant in anticipating and avoiding the things that happen either in community-based or residential programs or custody-based services practices and policies that are likely to re-traumatize people who have histories of trauma. And then trauma-informed care believes and upholds the importance of consumer participation in the development, delivery, and evaluation of services. So we're talking really about how do we include girls at every step of the way of our services um, in terms of program development, delivery, and evaluation so that we can provide really good victim-centered response, which is systemic focus on the concerns and needs of victims to ensure the compassionate and sensitive delivery of services, and this is key, in a non-judgmental manner. I think it's fair to say that we are very judgmental and sometimes even hostile in the juvenile justice system 
about girls who end up in the system, particularly girls of color. A victim-centered approach seeks to minimize re-traumatization associated with the criminal justice process. One of the um, foundational principles of trauma-informed care is do no further harm. Victim-centered response provides the support of victim advocates for all victims, empowers survivors as engaged participants in the process. Again, we're not doing things to girls, we're doing things with them. It provides survivors an opportunity to play a role in seeing their abusers and traffickers brought to justice. I think we have a long way to go as it relates to this last one. I think the um, Safe Harbors legislation for sexually exploited youth is going to help us with this. All right, we're going to shift to movement number two, although all of these things are connected. I really do see new energy for the national movement. Um, the three of us were talking about that with Anne earlier as well, that um, organization, national organizations that have conferences, there was a period of time in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s where we did focus quite a bit on girls, and then that slowly went away um, for a variety of reasons, funding, um, competing uh, interests, et cetera. But now we have uh, this new re-emerging movement. And it really is about um, based on reports that demand action. So I want to talk a little bit about um, this new report. If you have not seen the sexual abuse to prison pipeline in the girls' story 2015, please, please um, download that from the web, read it, share it with your colleagues, your program administrators, your legislators, your funders, your administrators, um, everybody. This really is our new best report on girls in the juvenile justice system and actually the child um, welfare system as well. This new report connects the dots in ways that we haven't quite done before in terms of a complete systemic response to understanding what the issues are for girls. It clearly articulates the issues with a great deal of um, current statistics and it provides well thought out recommendations for services at each point along the continuum. It really is our roadmap for how to improve services for girls. And these are just some quotes from that report. And again, many of us who've been working in the field for a long time, we know this. Um, but it's time, it's long past time that we actually do something about it. So it's nothing new that um, violence against girls is a part of our culture. Um, and indeed, sexual abuse is one of the primary predictors of girls' entry into the juvenile justice system. Many girls who experience sexual abuse are routed into the juvenile justice system because of their victimization. Once inside, girls encounter, and this has been true since we started locking up girls um, back in the you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, right? Um, they come into a system that was designed by males for males. And then when girls don't um, succeed or uh, succeed in any of our services, we typically blame girls rather than looking at our own system that was never designed for girls in the first place. And part of it is because we, are, we just don't necessarily identify and treat the violence and trauma that really is behind. It is the root of victimized girls' arrest. The more harmful still is the significant risk that the punitive approach has on girls that will re-trigger and actually re-traumatize them. We must examine our policies and procedures in community and residential custody-based services to look at how, how can we avoid triggering girls, re-triggering girls, and re-traumatizing girls, and really do all of this through a trauma-informed lens. Okay, um, now these are just some of the policy recommendations. Again, I'm asking you all to, if you haven't read this report, to download it and read it. Um, so these are just some of the ones that I'm pulling out as highlights. It's about training, training on gender bias, race bias, gender stereotyping to decrease girls' contact with the justice system. It really is talking about doing trauma screens in not only child welfare, but also in juvenile justice. Um, 
if we really want to get at the root causes of why they come into our systems, then we need to really raise the bar on our screening tools and our assessment tools to identify those issues. Um, and of course, we've been talking for years and years about cross-system collaboration between the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Um, but in many jurisdictions, I have heard people talk about that there is no data sharing between the two systems, which to me is just outlandish. Um, we need to figure that stuff out, folks, so that we can really take a look at um, girls. You know, when we have girls in the juvenile justice system, it began in, within the child welfare system, the child protection services. So we really have to get over that whole data sharing thing and work together. We need to add gender and culturally responsive components to improve services and outcomes for girls. We need to fully enforce and strengthen the Prison Rape Elimination Act. If you are not familiar with the Prison Rape Elimination Act in your um, organizations, I strongly encourage you to, one, first of all, ask your administrators about that. And then a really good resource, web resource, is to go to the National Prison Rape Resource Center. And it's at PREAResourcecenter.org to find out more information. The whole Prison Rape Elimination Act, as it relates to juvenile services, is about ensuring that youth are not sexually assaulted by other youth and that they're not sexually assaulted by um, staff in programs. Um, another recommendation to provide female specific physical and mental health care and justice set settings. Again, I'm adding female on culturally specific physical and mental health care and justice settings. And the other two are health screening and health treatment, which of course Leslie is going to talk with us about her, uh, the work, the great work that she's been doing. Okay, so the safe harbor movement for sexually exploited youth. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Federal Vic Trafficking Victims Protection Act. If you're not familiar with that, please find out about it. It says that in the US, United States right now that um, youth under the age of 18 can no longer be picked up, arrested, and charged with prostitution, that they are not prostitutes. Language is really important, folks, so we need to take that. Um, uh, stop calling kids prostitutes. And instead, they are victims of sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. So you can find out more information about the federal law. I am very proud to say that in Minnesota, along with a, a number of other states, we have enhanced the federal legislation to better serve our youth in Minnesota. Um, our movement is called the Safe Harbor Movement, No Wrong Door to Services. You, there's a link there that you can find out more about of what we're doing. Um, there's so much that we're doing all around the state. Um, there will be coming out after the first of the year model protocol for all people who work with kids in some ways, in whatever ways that they work with them, to um, understand identification of youth who are, at, who are at risk for sexual exploitation and or who are currently being sexually exploited, sex trafficking, trafficked, and then how to provide them with victim-centered services. The other thing I want to mention here is that um, as a part of the response to Minnesota youth, we conducted focus groups with youth, um, at-risk youth and survivor youth, as well as adult survivors of sexual exploitation. A document is available. It's called Voices of Safe Harbor Survivor and Youth Input for Minnesota Model Protocol on Sexual Exploitation, Sex Trafficking of Youth. It's available at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. It will be this week sometime. That website is mncasa.org. And you will hear the voices of youth saying how we all need to understand the sexual exploitation of youth based on real their reality and what we need to do in terms of a better response in whatever systems, uh, service delivery areas that we are in. All right, so my time is coming to uh, uh, end here, but I want to go over some of these resources. For more information about the JJPA PA Act, um, you can see that resource. I put the uh, website for the Sexual Abuse to Prison Pipeline, the Rights for Girls website, the National Crittenden Foundation, 
I mentioned them a couple of times. They, um, the Girls at the Margin Action Alliance is through the Nas National Crittenden Foundation, as is the National Girls Institute. Girls at the Margin is having a fabulous webinar tomorrow um, with Francine Sherman, one of the leading researchers on girls in the juvenile justice system that we have. So you can contact them. Um, every other year, we have a national workshop on adult and juvenile female offenders. It was in Connecticut this uh, past October. We're hoping it will be in Minnesota in 2019. Um, there's SAMHSA, the Girls Mentoring and Education Services GEMS, and a video services on trauma. So for those of you that want a good training resource, you can also go to Polaris. I had that up earlier on a different slide. And then also this is um, really good video series on trauma from the office. Uh, for victims of crime. Also, you can go to my website and see the following reports. Again, we have so many new good reports that help us connect the dots to trauma, um, racial, and other cultural disparities, like certainly the LBGTQ population, which I'm so happy Lori is going to talk about that, um, and what we can do to improve services for all girls in the justice system and the child welfare system. So I think my time is almost up, and I want to thank you, and I look forward to any questions that you have. Thank you, Paula. Our next presenter is Leslie Akoka. Leslie designed and created the Girls Health Screen and is the founder and executive director of the National Girls Health and Justice Institute. She lectures nationally and is a published author producing presentations and publications for national and state agencies, organizations, and foundations. Leslie? Hi. I'm honored to be here with all of you, particularly these phenomenal uh, colleagues that we have with us today. And I was also really thrilled to see that so many of the participants are actually involved in um, implementation of services within systems. So this is really going to be geared towards uh, taking um, six national studies that we've done, including very recent ones, interviews with over, over 5,000 girls, visits to 60 detention facilities across the country, and trying to bring research to action to you for girls. Before we get into um, the nuts and bolts of this, because this is a very practical presentation, I want to um, say, and I will advance my own slides. Hopefully, I'll remember to do it. Um, uh, I, will, I would like to tell a couple of the stories of these thousands and thousands of girls whom we interviewed to develop the Girls' Health Screen and whom we talk to now when they take the Girls' Health Screen in detention centers um, across the country. I don't have that much time, but one particular interview that um, we did with National Public Radio in Albuquerque, New Mexico, was with an 11-year-old girl who refused to um, identify herself, limit herself to a gender identity. And this little girl had actually just turned 11 or just turned 12 and had been sexually assaulted for years. Um, and once she was detained, um, because her, her interview indicated that she had had partners of both genders and she refused to wear uh, girl-specific clothing, this little girl who was deeply traumatized had to eat and shower and sleep alone, which, as you can imagine, really emphasized uh, and worsened the trauma that she felt. Um, because she took the girl's health screen, the standard intake for that facility did not necessarily identify her hopelessness and suicidality and fears in that moment. Because she took the girl's health screen, she was able to get the, health, the help that she needed. Um, more recently, in 2015, 
um, I did an interview in uh, a Los Angeles detention center with some officers who um, were caring for girls in the CSAT unit. They have a specific unit for girls who um, have experienced profound sexual abuse and trafficking. And this officer told me about a girl who um, uh, had been identified as a problem in school. And it turned out that the reason why she was a problem, like 40% of the girls who we found have taken the girls' house screen, she had um, a vaginal injury due to repeated sexual assault. So I just think it's important to put it in real context. So who are we? We are a nonprofit National Girls Health and Justice Institute. We're located in Los Angeles and San Francisco. But we, our goal is to make sure that every girl in every one of the 2,500 detention centers across the country has her health needs identified, treated, and followed. And we developed the Girls Health Screen and Passport to make this happen. Um, Many of you may not know, or perhaps you do, that um, because of 1965 Medicaid law, there isn't public Medicaid fund funding for boys and girls, men and women, entering, entering lock settings, which has resulted in a tremendous dearth not only of continuity of care for these kids, trauma care in particular, but also in um, interruption of health insurance. Kids really do fall into a, uh, a re-traumatization black hole of interruption of medical care. So the Girls' Health Screen is, to date, the only evidence-based health and mental health screen for girls at detention intake in the country that we know of. Why did we do this? You know most of these facts. While Men and boys have gotten a vast amount of attention, rightly so, over the past few years. For many years, we've known that proportionately girls are the fastest growing segment of the juvenile justice population. We know that they have unique and more serious physical and mental health needs, including reproductive needs, and that, as I said, they are often excluded from having their needs um, identified, met, treated, and followed. This dearth of real-time data is really important to me. I started out as a researcher. I still am. But the data that I am forced to look for is, from my point of view, in terms of systems like yours working with real girls coming through the door, way outdated. And uh, many of the recent reports uh, the data on sexual abuse and physical abuse seems to us to be inaccurate because it's not real time. So we really focused on getting real time data on what's actually going on with trauma, health, and mental health for those girls as they walk through your door. Um, the continuity of care between locked settings and um, community health care is deeply important to us. In many states, um, Health insurance is interrupted, and so if, if a system like any one of yours identifies and treats trauma and even things like tuberculosis, that may be well and good while they're in the facility, but what happens post-release if there's no uh, enrollment or re-enrollment in health insurance and no connectivity to medical homes where those providers understand and can treat the needs of the girls? Most of our girls are incarcerated for a relatively short time, so we have to be looking at health care as a pathway to health and justice for every girl and their families. These are some of the uh, reasons why we did the Girls' Health Screen. I touched on the lack of um, systematic screening and assessment. Uh, still only 18% of facilities regularly give girls pregnancy tests, although Depending on the jurisdiction, um, 16 to 20 percent of girls are pregnant while incarcerated. What is the Girls' Health Screen? The Girls' Health Screen is, as I mentioned, the first evidence-based physical and mental health screen designed and validated 
just for detained girls 11 to 17 years old. Um, we also, our partners, Juvenile Law Center and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and I also have always had a dream that it would be um, for foster children as well. Since half of the children taking the girls' health screen in 2015 have already been in foster homes at least once, and yet we have no national data really looking at who these kids are and what the flow between foster care and juvenile justice is. We really need to focus on both systems simultaneously. But we thought we'd uh, try to get health care to incarcerated girls first. So it's a triage model questionnaire. And what that means is that a child's most urgent problems, if they're bleeding, if they've just been raped, if they've stopped breathing, um, if they've just been hospitalized or identified first, and then their care and treatment needs, if they're going to stay in the facility, um, things like diabetic care or uh, reproductive health care, those things will dealt with are dealt with. And then advocacy needs. One of the things that um, is most upsetting to me is that the original trauma research, the adverse childhood experiences, uh, screens don't take into account things that really impact our girls and traumatize them permanently with things like homelessness. Nearly 40% of the girls taking the girls' health screen um, have been homeless at some point in the last year. And furthermore, 76% of them have been expelled or suspended from school. So we really need to identify what are those things that, that need to be taken care of immediately, a good example. In a California detention center last year was a girl who entered the facility who took their standard intake um, medical mental health screening that didn't identify that she was had an ectopic pregnancy and was also suicidal. The girl's health screen, because it integrates both health and mental health elements, um, identified both. So it's really a question, it's a policy question, but it's also a life or death question. And we're kind of the front door. The people who do relational issues and training and the programming for girls really need the information that we provide, and we need them to follow up and provide the treatment. The Girls' Health Screen is self-report. It's 117 um, items. It, it, some, yeah, 117 items. It takes about 11 to 15 minutes to complete. It can be done on an iPad, which they love. They touch little bubbles. And, um, and it can also be done uh, on, on the web. We will do it in paper in jurisdictions that don't um, have any electronic capacity. But uh, I think that doing it on an iPad is, or some other device is the wave of the future, although, of course, we have to be very careful about security. So the girls' health screen it looks like the girls that you see. And each page has a question or two. And um, the girls answer questions about themselves. The questions were designed not just by physicians or research. They were designed by the girls themselves. There are lots of people who have said, these questions are too direct. You can't ask these things. And yet, when we get feedback from detained girls themselves, the thing that they say, yes, ask the questions. And in fact, they're even more specific and direct than as adult researchers we would be. I won't go into all of these um, disturbing levels of problems that we see, except to indicate that um, I think we have to redefine trauma in terms of real-time information and experience of girls. Uh, something that I didn't expect is the 32% uh, having seen someone badly hurt or, or actually the wording in the questionnaire, I believe, is murdered in real life. The environmental violence, apart from um, the individual violence, is something that is very significant. And the very, very high percentage of girls who are identifying self-harm just as they get into 
detention um, should really give us pause and should make us want to identify these problems as early as possible. Part of the rationale for the girls' health screen um, was that one of our studies discovered that access to physical health care could reduce recidivism by 72 percent. Why the health pathway to justice hasn't been included in national discussions or even current coalitions to advance the well-being of girls is somewhat mysterious to me. So we've just proceeded with the work, and um, this is where we're doing it. Uh, I, my, I just I can't say enough about the Los Angeles County Department Departments of Probation, Health, Mental Health, um, and Health Services. They have coalesced in one of the largest systems in the country and and one of the largest systems in the world, really, to implement the girls' health screen as the standard intake for every girl. Um, it was started in 2012 and piloted in a camp where girls had already been adjudicated at the front door. And it was done in paper pencil at that point. In 2016, it will expand to serve all 2,000 girls in all three um, Los Angeles detention facilities in web format. I'm not going to say it was easy, but I will say that these, this, these probation leaders these health services and mental health folks have come together on behalf of girls in a way that um, I find very, very impressive. And they really um, are leading the country in this effort, particularly given the size of their system. And what happens when a girl, girl takes the girl's health screen is that she enters the answers to questions about her health and mental health. Those answers are immediately transmitted to health and mental health professionals in the facility, and they respond. Um, it's a scored instrument, which means that if a girl has a problem that's life-threatening, they respond immediately um, according to the triage model that I mentioned. Uh, my hat's also off to, to the GHS in, in San Joaquin County. San Joaquin County is, has a phenomenal uh, woman probation officer who said, we want this in San Joaquin. And while it's taken a long time to get the girls' health screen into uh, Los Angeles because it was where we started, San Joaquin County got the iPad version of the girls' health screen and integrated the girls' health screen into detention for every girl in Stockton inside of about three months. So it can be done. We're um, hoping and expecting to expand to serve um, girls in New York City and uh, for their juvenile justice and foster care systems. I am hoping to include foster care because what we hear from particularly the, ped the pediatricians who are doing the intake for children flowing through foster care and through foster care and detention is that they just don't have adequate information. So foster care, as much as juvenile justice, and sometimes with fewer resources, is having to conduct battlefield medicine with um, some of the most traumatized and sickest kids in the, in the country. So they're really anxious to um, get started on having a better screen for girls. Again, I'm so excited about New York being invited to start this process in New York City. It's just phenomenal. So how does it work? Um, as I mentioned, uh, it, the best case scenario is the girls' health screen gets adopted as the standard intake procedure. So whether it's foster care, detention, camp, long-term treatment, whatever it is, that the girls take the girls' health screen on entry. And so that information is immediately available. It should be part of what we're calling um, a girls' health passport that should be available to medical providers post-release. 
so that there's some continuity of care. It triggers, as I said, acute medical care and guides medical assessment and pre-release planning. It's been amazing to see how um, when a girl moves through detention, through camps, through longer-term treatment, or comes out more quickly than that, how the girl's health screen can uh, uh, specifically guide treatment, particularly for kids who are suicidal, self-harming, and might not otherwise have revealed those problems and behaviors. Um, I think the hardest thing that we've done is to turn this paper pencil questionnaire into secure web-based and iPad platforms. Um, one thing that county systems and state systems should know, I mean, we've proved it in San Joaquin in LA and hopefully we will in New York, the costs for assessing how to implement the girls' health screen and developing the technology, those should be one-time costs. The system, once we've set it up with you, belongs to you. The data, however, should help us develop a real-time profile of girls in the juvenile justice system rather than something that's years out of date or inconsistent. And that can actually help systems address, follow, treat, and record these problems immediately. Um, the people who pay for the girls' health screen are departments of health, mental health, probation. We've had some private foundation um, support and individuals. Um, our foundation supporters have primarily been on the health end. Uh, we'd like to have more uh, justice support as well. The actual implementation can be paid for uh, increasingly easily through um, public funds. So if you want to implement the Girls' Health Screen, contact us. The information is there. We'll do a system assessment of your jurisdiction. Look at your the data that you have about your girls, about the flow of girls through your system, about foster care, juvenile justice. We'll also look at the current instruments that you're using and compare them to what we might be able to offer you so you can see exactly what you're getting. The next step is to design a system that works for you. In San Joaquin, they wanted um, the iPads. In LA, they wanted um, a laptop web-based system. Some systems may still want paper, pencil. We really need to contribute to a national database on the health and mental health needs of girls. In, in my opinion, great reports notwithstanding, we really don't have that yet. And so I think that we need to come together and improve um, the collection and delivery of real-time data that can really help us. And it's not just data. In conclusion, I feel that what we're hearing through the girls' health screen that came, as I mentioned, out of thousands of interviews, and Lori Schaffner, whom you'll hear from, actually a long time ago helped conduct some of those interviews. And, and really this health focus and mental health focus, specifically for girls, is really the untold story of girls' bodies. Victimization happens to a body. Trauma is processed through a physical, you know, our bodies. Incarceration happens to us physically. And so I think that bringing health systems as a key pathway to justice for girls is really important. Thank you so much. I hope you have lots of questions. Thank you, Leslie. Our final presenter is Laurie Schaffner. Dr. Schaffner is a sociologist whose work focuses on gender, adolescence, morality, and the law. Her study of girls in detention in the United States, Girls in Trouble with the Law, earned the 2007 American Sociological Association Section on Childhood and Youth Award for Distinguished Contribution to Scholarship. Her advocacy, teaching, and research focus on girls' health and justice, the social control of gender and sexuality, youth under siege, and underprotected by state, 
and urban qualitative me methods. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Laurie Schaffner. Well, hello, everybody. And uh, it's so exciting to be here with you all and to be talking about such an important uh, issue that we've been thinking about for a long, long time and talking to young women for a long, long time, low these maybe even 20 years, because we know that uh, in the early 90s was when uh, uh, there was such a huge uptick in the in, uh, uh, in coming of uh, girls coming into the juvenile system that uh, we all jumped to assess what we could do for them and what was going on. Um, so today I want to talk about LGBTQ youth for you um, to kind of bring in another aspect of um, physical and mental health and um, well-being for young women. And um, I uh, would, would first start out by agreeing with everything that uh, Paula Schaefer and Leslie Akoka have said about health and about um, sexual abuse and how important it is for us to focus on gender that, you know, on the old saying, uh, paint the walls pink is, and you know, let the girls in is, is not gender specific enough. So um, I want to even be, be, go into that a little bit deeper and talk about what we mean when we talk about lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, transitioning, questioning, and queer youth, that the terminology changes all, all the time. Young people are Every, every week coming up with new ways of self-identifying and talking about themselves. And um, so these, these, what I call, could call to shorthand, uh, queer and non-gender conforming youth populations could include uh, intersex youth, transitioning, transsexual, transgender, questioning, gender queer, gender non-conforming. And I'm happy to discuss each of those individually. Uh, folks have more questions. Um, so recent ex uh, estimates you know, show that there are about 15% of young people in the detention that are LGBTQ youth. Um, I've just finished uh, interviewing yet another set of young people who are trading sex for um, uh, survival and other uh, other needs in Chicago, and we found that um, only 50% of those young people identified as heterosexual. Um, in the research I finished with uh, girls that were in detention, we found that 9% of the 100 girls that, of the interviews that I did um, reported um, not being heterosexual. So we we have a considerable uh, uh, you know, um, population, and um, we often hear, oh, we don't have any of those here, or none of our kids are like that. So if you're working with 300 children and young people and nobody has come forward, then <laughs> it's possible that they don't feel safe um, disclosing, which, you know, rightly so. Um, as with all youth in detention facilities, um, queer youth, and gender non-conforming youth are largely, mostly youth of color. And um, they are actually twice as likely to be um, arrested and detained for status and other nonviolent uh, offenses. So I want to emphasize that you know, folks whose life work focuses on youth, <laughs> such as parents and youth advocates and scholars, teachers, attorneys, social workers, judges, anyone involved in young people's lives must attend to the fluidity and context of such meanings, language, and terminology. Um, Lisa Diamond has written a wonderful book called Sexual Fluidity that talks a, a little bit more about that in detail. Um, in terms of uh, the violence and harm prior to coming into detention, um, which, as both Paul and Leslie have emphasized, often leads to their coming into detention because a disproportionate number of, of, of um, amount of uh, queer youth uh, 
experienced particular harms related to their sexual and gender identities. Um, early childhood harm and violence is reported. Be kicked out of their original family homes um, for being gay, um, running away from homophobia, homophobia in the home, dropping out of school because of bullying, because of homophobia, um, entering home from out-of-home placements where they don't feel safe or they're bullied. Um, not, many of these um, processes lead to homelessness, which lead to street survival sex and um, uh, attention to juvenile authorities. So we know that uh, um, you know, non-heterosexual youth suffer also a disproportionate um, educational and criminal justice punishment that is not explained by great, greater engagement in, in crime or uh, you know, poor um, scores in education. The violence um, in terms of uh, violence and harm while in detention um, includes what youth are telling us, um, feeling isolated, being separated, um, being segregated, um, they're being told that they're separated and isolated, <coughs> excuse me, for their own good to protect them. They constantly uh, must be vigilant against bullying and um, sexual abuse, youth on youth, sexual abuse, and also being harassed and abused by um, counselors or you know workers in the facilities. They're uh, Children, their children's rights and their human rights are not protected. Um, they experience a lack of community support, supportive folks and family and friends. Um, and they also are seen as only queer youth. When we freeze children as sexual, as Danielle Egan writes about, when we freeze them as only sexual or only their gender identity, we miss all these other aspects of their their lives and their personalities that um, you know um, you know help them live and, and um, thrive. Uh, so not the whole story about queer and gender nonconforming youth is often you know is the story is often told as all about violence and harm and abuse and homelessness. And in fact, many many young people who are LGBTQ and I are thriving in happy, healthy homes and doing wonderful things with their lives. You know, our focus, because it's focused on children in trouble with the law, tends to uh, make it seem like this is the main problem with their lives. And that's simply not true. Um, also, we see lots of resilience by young women. And um, it's, um, you know, framed as defying authority. But if we step back, we see that, for example, many reasonable requests for privacy, for example, um, when, when bathing or for companionship and company are, are reasonable requests, but they're not you know, easily uh, met in the, such buildings that we have for um, uh, these um, gender divided um, facilities. Also, you know, to ask to speak with someone from a local uh, lesbian or gay youth center or community resources, is, you know, they may not be on their visiting list. They may, that may be a request that's, you know, out of, uh, sort of out of the line with what's usually happening in these facilities, in detention facilities, but it is a reasonable request. It's often called defying authority, right? But they experience so many tiny administrative injustices um, that actually, you know, saying no, I don't want that. I want a companion. I want a roommate. Um, is is a healthy request to an unjust treatment of being uh, uh, isolated. Um, it's important to remember that queer and gender nonconforming youth are more than their sexual orientation or gender presentation. They're young people. They're girls. They're um, <laughs> um, you know, living with ad adolescent issues and problems just like all other girls. And we also notice as a, a resilience um, and resistance this use of humor and creativity, art, and conversation as a means of 
protection and safety and friendliness, identifying, letting people know who they are, wanting to let people know who they are, that they're more than just queer. Um, and that's important. So some of our best practices um, that you know we find are, first of all, addressing the challenges of the built space. So we're doing that all over um, in, in many of the institutions. For example, at the university, we have now um, what we call transgender bath, gender neutral bathrooms, or what they are is just regular bathrooms with the, the door closed and you have privacy. Now, um, this need for detached or single person bathing facilities is complicated in 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 our um, current detention facilities, but it can be achieved. Another um, uh, so, uh, practice that has worked is more gender affirming, or what we call co-ed units. Uh, and this can be achieved by, for example, having the oldest oldest girls housed with their youngest boys, so that it is co-ed in that sense. At, but that and then there you can put um, non gender nonconforming youth, and um, because it's a co-ed situation, also you know to have visible media and messages on posters and bulletin boards affirming this respect for all youth. Um, mandatory ed education and training by everybody, by qualified trainers, but for all who come into contact, including other youth. Sometimes when we explain to other youth, listen, this person is a male to female transgender, and a person is born as a boy, living as a girl, and um, you, th this person deserves respect, and um, we have to be polite and honor the pronouns that she wants you know, or, or however it works um, best to talk to youth about it. Young people are often, even young people in detention, often take about 10 minutes, you know, just like adults to say, oh, no, oh, no, and then they move on and they're fine. And also to engage local community in providing support and guidance for staff and youth. Almost every town and city has a lesbian and gay youth centers that can come in and <clears throat> do um, practice programs and, and trainings. Um, we really are underutilizing the resources that we do have available. So, for example, um, you know, calling calling in folks um, from these uh, community centers. Um, there are model standard pro, uh, pro, model standards for of legal services for youth. Um, and National Center for Lesbian Rights, they have a model standards for youth in the uh, child welfare system and in the foster care system for dealing with um, how to handle situations like um, a foster family does not want uh, to um, have a homosexual youth or, you know, what do we do if a youth wants to come out in a family that <clears throat> um, is a foster family. And so, um, there's also the, the UN Convention on the Rights of Children Deprived of Their Liberty has um, sort of just universal rights for children um, in detention. NCCD research and OJJDP research, um, you know, including Leslie Akoka's er, earlier work, um, you know, has um, uh, now several national reports. Um, that are um, address this issue. Youth-led research is very important. Um, when when they do do it, the the, the reports they issue are are um, you know right exactly to the problem. And peer-reviewed social science research um, and critical analyses. Basically, thinking about gender and um, gender nonconforming and queer youth in the system requires us to rethink what we mean by gender specific and to what we mean by gender responsive, as well as cultural competent and, and, and trauma informed. And that we need to remember to assume, not assume all the young people we work with are heterosexual to make it a safe place. I know that when I do my research, I ask in different ways, um, you know, are, are you, um, straight or queer or lesbian or how do you identify and by making it safe for them to say well oh, I say I buy that um, you know create it sends a message that they're speaking to someone who is um, a safe person to speak to 
Um, so I want to say that <clears throat> categorically, it is not gender specific, and it is not gender responsive, and it is not culturally competent, nor is it trauma informed to hold youth, LGBTQ youth, in secure detention for nonviolent minor or status offenses when they are not a danger to themselves or others. Um, and that, it, you know, so locking girls up is not gender responsive to begin with. And we need to, you know, start there and keep thinking about where, how better can we get the girls out of the system as quickly as possible. Um, and I want to say that the juvenile system is not equipped to protect and respect the rights of LGBTQ youth. Well, how should they, how could they be? Most institutions are not. And, you know, we're, it's at a, we're at a time where we're all learning how to do this together. And um, so queer youth, gender nonconforming youth, and their allies um, are, you know, learning together how best to, um, uh, you know, um, regard this population and make sure they're safe and comfortable. Um, my recommendations are the recommendations are the same as as all of ours. You know, lots of mandatory training and learning forms for all personnel and and residents that focus on a critical understanding of what it is to be gay or lesbian and what it does not mean. It does not mean that you are constantly looking for if you're a girl looking for other girls to have sex with. That um, it doesn't um, you know necessarily mean that. The, um, you know, you want to be alone or you need protection. You know, maybe <clears throat> the other young people would need, need more information. Um, we should link compliance with some kind of funding or some have to have some kind of bang to it or we will continue to hear homophobic slurs under, uh, you know, folks' breath and all the things that we um, are here and see now. We need an improved... Uh, confidential systematic data collection, and which is what I think we're all, uh, I know that um, uh, Leslie Akoka's work is arguing for, and um, youth-led participatory action research on this population has been doing many interesting reports, and um, to also adopt a social justice, transformative justice, children's rights perspective um, in, in working with these youth. So I um, am ending with suggested, some suggested readings. Um, and you're welcome to email me, and I can send more. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Laurie and uh, Paula and Leslie. I want to thank all of our presenters for the information that they've shared with us today. And at this point, we are going to field as many of your questions as possible. So bear with me, and we'll see what we can uh, cover in the time allowed. Uh, first, the first question I want to direct towards Paula. Um, can you provide more information about the federal law and youth under 18 and prostitution? Yes. Um, there's the website that's on my PowerPoint. But if you go to my website, pschafer.com, um, on the re hit the resource tab, and then there's a paragraph under resources. And before, it says recent article studies research. If you click there where it says click here to download, you'll find a whole host of resources on girls, girls in juvenile justice, child welfare, trauma, um, sex trafficking, and LGBTQ kids. But there's um, three other additional ones I want to mention. The Advocates for Human Rights. So this is in regard to sex traffic youth. So it is the advocatesforhumanrights.org, Shared Hope International, and that website is sharedhope.org, and then ECPAT USA, and it's e c p a t u s a dot org. Okay, thank you, Paula. Um, we have a, uh, some a number of questions about the girls' health screen, and I'm going to try to select some that are somewhat related. So I'll start with a question and then maybe have a couple follow-ups. Um, I th think the first question I want to ask it about Leslie about that is I found very interesting. 
And the question here says, as girls rightly do not experience the system as safe, do you have data that suggests self fairly and fully disclosed in the screen? Yes, and, and that's really why we developed the screen. Uh, what we did was the, the validation process, which took us a very long time, um, was done the way we were able to find out that the girls were telling us not just the truth of their physical experience and their mental health experiences, but also were identifying their health problems more accurately than on other intake screens, is that when we validated the screen first across the country in detention centers, we not only gave it to every girl entering um, three det detention centers nationally, but we trained their health and mental health practitioners to do um, physical and mental health exams that followed up specifically on the problems that the girls identified. And then we compared what they were identifying um, on the girls' health screen to a matched set of girls who had not taken the girls' health screen but who had entered over a similar period of time. And because the girls' health screen is self-report, and the girls answer it themselves. Sometimes they need a little help, but mostly they answer it themselves. And because it's private and immediate, um, and because, interestingly enough, if you listen to the NPR uh, radio show, the girls like the fact, maybe it should be multi-gender screen, but they like the fact that it said girls' health screen. It wasn't government. It wasn't county. They they took it to respond to them. So the answer is that the validation research bore out that they answered the questions accurately and that it identified health needs, particularly recent sexual assault. 20, over 20% of the girls who take the girls' health screen have experienced a, se a recent sexual assault. And that was not being identified using standard intake um, tools or procedures. So we thought that was very important. Does that, is that a complete answer? Sounded pretty comprehensive to me. Thank you very much, <laughs> Leslie. Um, I, I wanted to, there were there's some other questions about the girls' health screen, but I wanted to uh, make sure everybody has a chance to get some questions answered. Um, and this one didn't come up, but Laura, could you talk a little bit about how your recommendations relate to PREA standards, are you recommending um, perhaps that we provide services that even go beyond what is required by PREA? Are they pretty similar? Everyone's struggling with PREA these days, so it would probably be helpful to know. I think Laurie, are you, did you hear my question? Maybe you're muted. I'm sorry, I was muted. Okay, did you hear my question? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think that the, uh, the, the notion of queer youth, um, that it immediately relates to rape or, uh, you know, prison rape, you know, is, is a misconception. Like, I, um, Gender non-conforming youth are, you know, as likely or not as likely to be uh, predators or um, uh, as as any other young people. So in that sense, I, I think Korea applies exactly to these youth. I think the issue is that the the, the queer and gender conforming youth, non-conforming youth, are not the problem, right? The problem is us the system, the, the facility, the setup, the, uh, how to provide safety. Um, and, w you know, w when we immediately use 
um, you know, a, so for example, when you have, um, when you go into an intake, a, a, facility, a detention facility, you're often in an intake unit, right? Well, in the intake unit is where we could, um, it's when we do do our screening, right? We do PREA training, we do our, um, and that's where we could do some training on in this, you know, personally, you know, I would argue too that the young people need some uh, help, uh, critical uh, information about racism and how racism works because, you know, they're going to notice that almost 99% of the people in this um, in the facility are youth of color and to talk about, you know, be able to talk about how that doesn't necessarily reflect that youth of color are more criminal. Same with saying that, you know, there may be uh, gender nonconforming youth or um, queer youth that doesn't necessarily assume that they have a different kind of um, sexual appetite or sexual practice in that sense of um, 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 predation. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not, I'm not speaking directly to Priya because I haven't read Priya in about two years. Okay. So I can't speak directly to it, but I do remember that um, I do think it's interesting that it often comes up when you talk about differently oriented, sexually oriented youth. And, it, you know, in fact, most, you know, rape is committed by straight people, youth. Sure. sure. Can I just but, add but something? Please. Okay, this is Paula. I, I would say that in or out of facilities, we know that LBGTQ kids are at greater risk for physical and sexual assault um, yes. wherever they find themselves. So I think it's an mm -hmm. issue of raising awareness. And more, you've covered this about training, you know, the mm -hmm. need for understanding the, the lives of LBGTQ youth and, you know, their strength, their resiliency, and the risk factors for harm to them, et cetera. I think that's a really important part of PREA and that um, juvenile justice facilities and um, community-based providers have to understand that and take, uh, you know, strive. they need to be able to protect all youth but understanding that some kids are at greater risk. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think one of our um, participants made that point, too. PREA is designed to protect all youth. But there are some standards in PREA that specifically um, address the unique needs of the LGBTQI mm -hmm. population and mm -hmm. require certain things on behalf of the facility to do that. So. Um, Can I add just one little piece to that? Please. Yes. Um, one thing uh, to think about, too, in terms of health needs having to do with gender identity is that there are some kids who are entering systems who are undergoing um, medical treatment to transition. And so interruption of that treatment or denial of that treatment is, um, or medical care is something to think about, to add into the mix when we're thinking about continuity of care for every child. Uh, Leslie, does the girls' health screen address that issue at all? It identifies the, um, it's, in, it's a bit of a hybrid in that most health screens are only about 10 questions, and of course we're more than that, we're 117 in multiple domains of kids' lives. Um, we do, identify um, medications and health needs and preference for sexual partners, I think we'd like to improve or add to um, sexual identity questions without um, burdening. We can't make it too long. That's always the choice for us. Um, it, kids have, it, in, a county like LA, for example, that has thousands and thousands of kids coming in. If we want to do this, we have to do it correctly. But we do get to that question, but I think we could improve it, and we will. Okay, okay. Um, 
And uh, one of our one of our participants wanted to know if the, if the girls' health screen is in line with the National Commission on Correctional Health Care Standards. Yes. Okay. And, and in fact, it, it's it's surprise. It's um, again, it is very surprising to me that uh, first of all, the the standards are lacking, and if we're looking to a long term solution to mass incarceration, one of the major projects that we could engage in long term, not next week, but is the lifting of the inmate exclusion part of 1965 Medicaid law that really results in lack of insurance for millions of people who are in locked settings. So yes, we are. It's a short okay, answer. Great. Um, I have a question that is sort of a two-part question, and it's really for each of you, so feel free. Um, and I'm going to, I may try to paraphrase, and I apologize if I misunderstand. This, this uh, participant wanted to know where the presenters stand on the use of out-of-home care for juvenile justice-involved girls. And I think this is more systemic. For example, how do we consider the issues that you have discussed today in making juvenile justice decisions in general, such as placement and what services are to be provided. Um, and, and the question goes on to say, it seems easier to explain or understand the female responsive approach in terms of programming and services, and less so in terms of how they move through the system. So um, if any of you want to, Paula, you, since you're, you're your um, presentation was a little bit broader in terms of the whole system. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a big question. Um, I'll try to keep this short. I would, I would direct folks, all of us, back to the sexual abuse to prison pipeline to take a look at um, what we can do from a systemic standpoint to improve services for girls and prevent them from getting in the juvenile justice system in the first place. And then I want to address the first part of that, if I understand it correctly, um, in terms of out-of-home placements. We, we don't need to send girls to so many out-of-home placements, period. I mean, from a justice in, uh, standpoint, a fairness, et cetera, research is telling us that if we can keep girls in the community and have really good community-based programs that are female and culturally responsive, that they will do much better than sending them, you know, far away from their families and other kinds of support. So I think one of the things that we all need to focus on with all the good information that Leslie has been talking about and Lori as well is that we need to keep our kids in the community. We need to keep our girls mm -hmm. close. We need to provide services. And there are good services in our communities. I know there's, that's an issue for rural communities, but we can still do a much better job of that. Thank you. Uh, Laura, you might want to follow up on that, too, because I think what, from what I understand from your presentation, um, in addition to locking girls up to protect them historically, the juvenile justice system does that with the LGBTQ youth more than. So we're seeing those youth confined for things like status offenses more than the non-LGBTQ youth. Is that correct? Is that correct? Yes, and I think, I think it's also interesting that a lot of LGBTQ youth are coming in from out-of-home placement and foster families. Yep. So that even tells us more about, you know, so getting them back into a good group home may not be necessarily, you know, and I'm using that, you know, in quotes, air quotes, you know, because that may not be um, what is at the heart of the issue. So, for example, in, in Chicago, we have several youth centers, youth organizations, and um, agencies that work with um, queer and gender nonconforming youth. And we need more, of course. And we, try, we also can utilize our high schools and, and colleges better, you know, to, um, you know, form, to start groups and to start work with young people, but uh, queer people. But yes, I think that, um, you know, addressing it in a in a in a way that you know, yeah, is pre pre 
trouble because the, the trouble they're getting into is usually nonviolent, um, if, if anything, drug offenses, homeless offenses, and, um, and you know, with the new, um, they're considered victims now of, of trafficking rather than, um, you know, trading sex. So um, that also presents um, a lot of um, problems if we can get queer youth involved in the safe harbor legislation and, and make it work for them, that, you know, I think is a really, would also be a really good addition or direction. Great. Thank you. Um, what, uh, what I, ju I just want to, can I ahead. just Thank add you, something Leslie, really ahead, briefly? Mm -hmm. um, if, if we look at the, just the possibility that acts, improving access and continuity to physical health care could reduce recidivism and violent offending amongst girls. I, I just think we have no business not doing it. If we talk about prevention, if we talk about keeping kids out of juvenile justice, let's do these kinds of interventions in, or assessments, screenings, uh, trainings very early on in um, middle schools and, and, and late primary schools. Um, we were invited to do the girls' health screen in Solano County with their um, most disadvantaged middle school girls, and there wasn't the funding to do it. But I think it could really help to broaden not just our approach, but all of the efforts that we're discussing early on in school and community settings, because as Lori says, the vast majority of these kids just don't belong there at all. Right. Thank you. And uh, we're about out of time. I'm going to uh, field just one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. And this is a question, I think, for all three of the presenters. So if you can very briefly talk, if you can, about any model programs that you're finding successful in developing community resources that also serve families to keep youth, help these youth stay in their own communities. And if not, that tells us something also. Um, yeah, this is Lori. Um, in, um, in Chicago on the north side, of course, there's a couple of um, uh, programs. On the south side, um, the, the, some, some of the more successful programs for young people are, are like, um, driven by young people. So, or, so for example, um, there's a black lesbian group called Affinity. They deal mostly with adults, but when young women show up, they address. Um, I mean, I, but I think that um, we definitely need to develop these programs um, I can, you know, I know of one program that was doing great work, but they were so harassed, they were working with young women uh, who trade sex in the street economy, and they were so harassed by the police for, um, you know, harboring trafficked girls. I mean, this is a youth-led program that they, if they went underground. They, so in, in terms of, you know, queer youth and, some of their needs, I think that, um, you know, it, we need to develop and fund and um, use more of our, the resources that we have. I know like in my, at the university, there's um, all, all kinds of young, young people that are wanting to work with teenagers and youth, queer youth, and in the, in the legal system. You know, we were running a, um, a girl talk program, and then we did a talk out program for after they got out because um, they wanted to keep working together. So, I, you know, they, they're there. We have to find them, and, and you're right. We have to develop them. We have to um, fund them. Okay. Thank you, Laurie. Um, I, we're about out of, well, we are out of time, so I'm going to wrap things up for today. I want to thank thank all of our participants and especially our three presenters for being involved in this webinar. Um, again, I just want to remind everyone, please take a few minutes to complete our online survey. It's very important for planning for future web webinars and meeting your needs. And again, remember that this webinar will be archived on the OJJDP online university. So if you 
I know some folks were having difficulty accessing the information. The, the, uh, the audio may have not been clear enough and various things. So the PowerPoint presentations and the webinar itself are certainly available for you. Um, I want to, again, personally thank the National Training and Technical Assistance Center for their support of today's broadcast. Please watch for announcements about future webinars. And until then, I'm Ann Nelson. Good afternoon. Is anybody still on? I am. I'm just not sure what else, who else is and who can hear. So I'm not, that's why I didn't say anything. So they can't hear us, can they? Um, I don't think so. Adam? Hi. Anyhow, I thought it was great. I thought it was awesome. And I wanted to say that to Lori and Leslie, too, before they got off. You did a great job facilitating, Anne. Well, it wasn't that hard, but it was, um, you know, I think we could have gone, each one of you could have gone on, not just with your presentations, but they, the Q&A could have gone on a lot yeah. longer, too. Um, right. But some but of the was, questions, was I was really just not, I, I read some of the questions, and I wasn't 100% clear what the person was asking. So I tried to paraphrase, and I thought, I'm probably not, when I paraphrase, I'm probably changing the question completely, but who knows. You did what great. That was great. Yeah, it was Thank really you. awesome. Thank you for including me, and, and I hope we'll get a chance to do this again, maybe at an MPJS conference. Yes, or, you know, again, it would be so much nicer in person, so hopefully yeah. we'll get that opportunity. I think Michael will yeah. be in touch with all of us about that option um, and the possibility of doing something perhaps at the National Symposium next fall, which is Sounds going to be great. in Colorado, well, by the way. Oh, I love Cal Colorado, so that'd be oh. great. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, Anne. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.